guys, Miss Miklos here, and today we are learning something completely new for you, for all of you, and that is the concept of complex numbers. And you might be thinking, well, what the heck is a complex number? And this is an example of our standard form of a complex number, A plus BI. And I just want to explain both of these aspects in a little bit more detail. A represents a real number, so at this point that's every number that we've ever worked with. That BI represents what we call an imaginary number. And we've never seen imaginary numbers before, and that's really what we're focusing on today, is this whole concept of an imaginary number. A complex number, though, is when we have a real portion and an imaginary portion combined. Back in Algebra 1, you definitely had some problems like this where we had the square root of a negative number. And my guess is you guys probably answered not real, which is a true statement. And up until today, you have not had the knowledge necessary in order to go ahead and solve this. So the way that we're going to go through solving something like this, or I should rather say simplify because it's not an equation, I'm going to split it up as the square root of 9 times the square root of negative 1. And the major concept for us today is that i is equal to the square root of negative 1. And you guys might be thinking that I'm just writing i pretty like this because um, I like things to look nice. But I'm really writing i in this way because this is specifically representing a number. So it's kind of like a backwards j where we have a hook and we make our i bigger than normal. Okay, so if I go back to this problem right here, I'm going to figure out what is the square root of 9, and that would be 3. And then what is the square root of negative 1? Well, the square root of negative 1 is equal to i. So I'm going to say my answer here is 3i. So with this knowledge, we can actually find the radical of any number. If you're paying attention, in standard form, we only have i. I don't have anything that is i to a higher power. So it is important that we know how to convert i's with exponents into something that we are used to. We know anything to the first power is itself, so i to the first power is equal to i. i squared is actually equal to negative 1. And the reason being, if we think about when we're squaring something, the square root of negative 1 times the square root of negative 1, negative 1 times negative 1, we have a pair, so negative 1 goes out in front. Notice I'm not actually multiplying them and getting a positive value. I'm just looking for pairs. This one is extremely important for us to know. We use the fact that i squared equals negative 1 quite a bit. Our next one, i cubed, would become negative i because i times negative 1 is negative i. That would be like i to the first times i squared. And i to the fourth is like the quantity negative 1 squared or 1. One thing that we will see about this is that it is just a pattern that repeats every fourth. So i to the fifth is the same thing as i to the first. i to the sixth is like i squared and so forth. So the way that we kind of go about solving something bigger, like if we had i to the eleventh, I'm going to have to think back to third grade and use some long division. I'm going to take my exponent and put it inside my division, little symbol thing, and I'm going to divide by four, and the reason why I'm dividing by four is because it repeats every four. So I know 4 goes into 11 2 times, 2 times 4 is 8, and my remainder is 3. The remainder becomes our exponent. So I know i to the 11th is the same thing as i cubed, which is negative i. So we're going to do a few more, we're going to do one more of these, but the key thing is we actually do need to have these four values memorized. That's something you need to spend time making sure that you know and you're aware of. Okay, so let's do one more of these. 
let's say we had i to the hundredth power. So I'm going to take 100 and divide it by 4. And I know 4 goes into 10 2 times, 2 times 4 is 8. When I subtract, I get 2 and I bring down my 0. 4 goes into 20 5 times, so I subtract and I get 0. And this is kind of weird that 0 is my remainder. But let's just think about this for a second. I to the 0 power. What is anything to the 0 power equal to? And it's actually equal to 1. And if we look, I to the 4th is actually equivalent to I to the 0 power. The reason being, if I'm dividing by 4, I will never be left with 4 as a remainder because something else will go into it. So we could think of it either as I to the 4th. I actually think it's easier to think of as I to the 0 power because we've learned previously anything to the 0 power is 1. Okay, so let's do a problem that's a little bit different. This is what our homework is actually going to look like tonight. So it's building off of last time. The very first thing I'm going to do is rewrite this as the square root of 20 times the square root of negative 1. Now with 20, I know I'm going to do a factor tree. So that would be 4 and 5. So it would be 2 times 2 times 5, which gives me 2 radical 5. I know the square root of negative 1 is i. So I can either write it as 2 radical 5i or 2i radical 5. Okay, it really depends on the textbook. We will see it in either of these two forms. Um, I think the important thing if we're writing it in this way was to make sure that we're noticing that the i is not underneath the radical. It's afterwards. So it's like 2 radical 5 is my coefficient. So number 2, same idea. I'm going to think of this as the square root of 75 times the square root of negative 1. And really, if you haven't noticed, we are really doing problems exactly like our last lecture, except we're putting an i after. That's the only difference. I know 75 is 25 times 3, so I'm going to think of this as 5 times 5 times 3. So I have my group of 5's that I can take out, so I have 5 radical 3 i. Or once again, we could write this as 5 i radical 3. It doesn't matter which way we do it. Our next type of problem is going to be just simplifying values when we have i values in there. And the nice thing is we treat i's just like a variable when we're combining ter like terms. So we know if I was adding x plus 2x, I would add their coefficients together and get 3x. So I'm going to do a similar thing when we're adding i's, I just need to combine their coefficients. So if I'm adding things together, I get 7 because 4 plus 3 is 7. Negative i plus 2i becomes plus i. So this is my answer. Notice I have my real portion first, my imaginary portion second. Okay, number four. This is a problem that everyone tends to get wrong because we forget to distribute the negative. So I'm going to think of this as 7 minus 5i minus 1 plus 5i because I need to distribute this negative to everything. When I add my like terms together then I get 6 and my two i values cancel each other out. So my final answer is just 6. So on our test we definitely are going to be having problems where we're just simplifying um, with imaginary values. However, I know we're excited for this. Imaginary numbers are now going to be integrated throughout all of our problems. For example, number five here, we need to solve. So since I just have a squared term and a constant, I'm thinking I'm going to solve using radicals. So I'm going to begin by multiplying both sides by negative two, because that is going to isolate my squared value. Now, just like we learned last time, I'm going to square root both sides, and we learned we need to plus or minus whenever we put a square root over a number. So I get x plus 1 equals plus or minus. 
the square root of negative 10, I know we're going to have an i value, and I actually cannot do anything with the square root of 10. So I get plus or minus the square root of 10i. So when I'm solving for this, my answer is negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 10i. Now once again, we learned last time, if things are squared, that means I have two answers. So I have negative 1 plus radical 10i, negative 1 minus radical 10i. So you might be thinking right now, well, how does that relate to graphs? Because last in the previous two lessons, we've really talked about the fact that our answers are our x-intercepts, or where it crosses the x-axis. When we have imaginary answers, this is what our graph looks like, where notice it's never going to cross the axis. So imaginary numbers are important for us to know. It just affects our graph slightly. So if we ever see parabolas that don't cross this line, we know that the answers are indeed imaginary. So back to some evaluating and simplifying. I'm just going to distribute that 5i so I get negative 10i plus 5i squared. And I have a problem here. We said we should never leave i squared, i cubed, etc. in our problem. So I need to think back to i squared. We said i squared is equal to negative 1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute in negative 1 instead of i squared. When I multiply these two together, I get negative 5. I'm going to write that first because I know my real part needs to come first. My imaginary part comes second. So our answer here is negative 5 minus 10i. Number 7, we have two binomials multiplied together, so we know that we need to FOIL. So first terms, we get negative 7. Outside terms, I get plus 14i. <clears throat> Inside terms, I get plus 4i. And last terms, negative 4i times 2i, I get negative 8i squared. Now, we've kind of already talked about this, and let me just simplify some stuff. I know I have negative 7 plus 18i, and we said that i squared is the same thing as negative 1. So I know that this is really like negative 7 plus 18i plus 8. Now, obviously, I'm writing out a lot of steps here. This is something we're going to get really familiar with and really good at, and so we can skip some of these steps. I know we're not done because our like terms are not combined. So when I combine those, I end up getting 1 plus 18i. Number 8, we have another FOIL problem. But if we look at these two binomials, we're going to notice that these terms are the same. The only thing that has changed is their signs in between. Our mathematical term for that is what we call a conjugate pair. Okay, so a conjugate pair means I have the same terms, different sign. And we're going to notice something when we FOIL this. I would get 36 minus 18i plus 18i minus 9i squared. I notice that my inside and outside terms cancel each other out. Negative 9i squared is really like positive 9 because I know it's negative 9 times negative 1. So I end up getting 45. This is kind of interesting because I multiplied imaginary values together and I ended up with a real answer. And I want you to know this is going to be true every single time whenever I multiply conjugates together we will always get a real number as our answer. I want to go through this next one because often we make mistakes on this. Whenever I am squaring a binomial, that means I am multiplying it by itself. So I'm going to write it out twice, and when I FOIL, I get 9 plus 6i plus 6i plus 4i squared. 
Once again, I know that 4i squared is the same thing as negative 4. Negative 4 plus 9 is 5. 6i plus 6i is 12i. So I have 5 plus 12i. So on to the two toughest problems. Okay, if we look at this, 1 over 1 plus i, it doesn't really look like there's much that we can do. However, we have a major problem here. We can never have a radical in the denominator. And you might be thinking, well, I don't have a radical, but we actually do because I know i is the square root of negative 1. So what we need to do here is to multiply by the conjugate. We already saw the fact um, on a previous problem that when I multiplied by the conjugate, I ended up with just a real number as my answer. So I need to figure out what is the conjugate of 1 plus i? And that would be 1 minus i. I know I need to multiply the numerator and the denominator because it is an expression and I know I can only multiply by 1. So looking at this, 1 times 1 minus i is just 1 minus i. In the denominator here, I'm going to have to FOIL this. So I get 1 minus i plus i minus i squared. So if we are combining stuff, I know negative i squared is like minus negative 1 or plus 1. So I end up getting 2 because 1 plus 1 is 2. When I combine my i values, they cancel each other out. Now I know this cannot be my final answer because it's not written in the correct form. I need to split this up into my real portion and my imaginary portion. So this is 1 half because 1 divided by 2 is 1 half. Negative 1 i divided by 2 is negative 1 half i. Last problem of our notes. Once again, I have an i in my denominator. This i in the numerator, totally fine. I can leave it. So I need to figure out what is the conjugate of 1 minus 2i. And that is going to be 1 plus 2i. Because we know it is the same two terms, opposite sign. So when I, so when I FOIL the numerator, I get 5 plus 10i plus 3i plus 6i squared. When I FOIL the denominator, I get 1 plus 2i minus 2i minus 4i squared. In my numerator, 6i squared means negative 6. 5 minus 6 is negative 1. 10i plus 3i is 13i, so I have negative 1 plus 13i. In my denominator, these i's cancel out. I know negative 4i squared is like positive 4. 1 plus 4 is 5. So now I need to split this up and it would become negative 1 fifth plus 13 fifths i. So this is a concept that is definitely going to be integrated into all of our upcoming lessons. We won't factor with imaginary stuff, but we definitely will see some problems like the one in our notes today where we had to square root with imaginary. So this is just something to get really familiar with. Make sure we know i is equal to the square root of negative 1, i squared is negative 1, i cubed is negative i, and i to the fourth is positive 1.